Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma sambhutasa Aparuta de sangamatasa tavara Ye sodavanta bamunchan tu satang. So this evening is the uh, full moon night, July, and the uh, uh, day that the Buddha gave his first sermon after his enlightenment, the Tamajaka Pawantana Sutta. And I thought I'd bring this. This is. Uh, uh, the Tamajaka Pavatana Sutta uh, that Ajahn Sajito gave me many years ago. It's his uh, pièce de résistance. It's uh, calligraphic, calligraphic uh, creative version. It's the traditional Pali version with English translation. But you can see Ajahn Sajito's mindset as he as he developed this whole Tamajaka Sutta. It's very beautifully done. And he did this for me at uh, Chithurst. When we chanted the Tamajaka Sutta, I'd have a, a kind of special edition. But it's a bit heavy. <laughs> to hold up like this there. But I thought I'd leave it here for those of you who are interested in looking at it. It's quite beautif beautiful and he's a very creative kind of uh, person who uh, you know, has this kind of natural talent. I don't think he ever had any uh, training in art, but he has, he has kind of an amazing ability to produce things, calligraphic uh, versions of the Tamajaka plus the kind of artwork and creativity from his mind as he contemplated and meditated on the on this teaching. So I'll leave it here for those that wish to look at it. And he gave it to me as a gift, so I value it very much uh, for both its uh, beauty and also the kind of generosity, goodness of heart that inspired Arjun Sajito to do such a thing. But um, anyway, the, the real practice is in applying it to your own experience. And so this is, uh, is what we're here for. And tomorrow we, the Sangha enters the Vasa uh, committing ourselves, determining to stay the three months uh, till the full moon of October uh, uh, here in, in, in this uh, monastery. We can go out only for not more than seven nights and uh, called Sataha for we have to have good reasons. We can't just go out uh, for pleasure seeking. But anyway, this is a, a way of training monastic life, learning to live within boundaries, uh, commitment to, uh, to this tradition, and having boundaries on behavior and speech. And so I say in ordinary life, there are not many boundaries left. It's pretty much. Uh, do what you want, say what you want, and uh, uh, think what you want. Uh, and so there's a, it's a time where the moral boundaries are not very clear. When we think of what morality really is, uh, you know, we just the first precept that they, I gave the, the Anagarikas, Banadibhata, not to intentionally kill any human being. <coughs> that is uh, 
That's a, a moral precept, meaning that we agree. We all, you know, when they said they, they were taking that precept, they, that means that they're agreeing to refrain from intentionally taking the life of any human being. Now, I'm sure that they're not prone to murderous uh, feelings or activities, but just think of the power of this precept, uh, that, that this is a precept that I wish the, the human society throughout the world would take, and that would be the end of war, wouldn't it? Not to intentionally kill uh, another human being. So this is, uh, this is what we call, it's a moral agreement. Now we all have desires and emotions. We're quite capable of committing murder. Uh, we can even feel murderous at times, even in monasteries. And uh, this kind of feeling, uh, this emotion, this desire to annihilate, destroy, harm, seek revenge, get even, is, uh, you know, what melodrama is about, what tragedy is, what, uh, you know, when we go to the cinema and the opera and various other uh, entertainments that play on these themes of jealousy and revenge and, and uh, murder, adultery, uh, and so forth, dishonesty, deceit, deception, drunkenness and addiction, on and on like this. So on, in this, uh, in a monastic form, then we have this, this moral convention, which is, uh, it doesn't mean that we never have lustful thoughts or have ever feelings of wanting to murder somebody, but we determine not to act on it or speak on it. So then that, then this point is to be mindful and aware of what we are thinking and feeling, of uh, the various desires that arise and cease in our consciousness during the day and night. So this Dhammajaka Pavatana Sutta is uh, based on this, on the common experience of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness. And so I've contemplated dukkha now for, this is my 43rd vasa as a bhikkhu. And uh, so that's a long time, more than half my life, of course, <laughs> uh, has been spent contemplating dukkha or un dissatisfaction or dis-ease, or discontentment. Because in monastic life, it's not like the dukkha that I've had as a Buddhist monk is, is anything, you know, terrible. Anything caused by, uh, you, know, un, you know, really being abused or, or exploited in any way whatsoever. But it's the dukkha of being discontented of the of the human karma, of having this vipaka karma, of having th this kind of character, of, of just uh, being caught up into the sense of myself, self-importance, fears and desires, jealousies, envy, feelings of inferiority, feelings of superiority, arrogance, conceit, Desire, sexual desire, lust, and all the rest. Confusion, uh, doubt, despair, skepticism, negative states, depressing thoughts. So these are, I think we can all relate to these words that I've been repeating, because these are part of our humanity, of being a human individual. We have, we experience the emotions, we feel life, and we create an emotion around that, what, we, what happens. And we also remember, we have a retentive memory, so we have memories of, of the past, where we can, which, which, where emotions, when we remember things, uh, unpleasant 
things of the past, we can feel angry or resentful or if we feel happy or sad accordingly. So in the, this vata, you know, this uh, vata is a special time to, uh, that we have every year uh, to make determinations, to, to not to, not ascetic ones particularly, to, you know, kind of go without sweets or whatever on that level, but to really, you know, determine to, to uh, put this practice into the reality of daily life here at Amravati, no matter what happens. So it takes a determination to, because we don't have that much control over making everything the way we would like it to be. You know, people want harmony and peace and love and happiness is, uh, is uh, what people would like to have. And, you know, so that we, everybody gets along and everybody's happy and considerate and thoughtful. But that's not necessarily the vipaka kama of any of us in the present moment. So we, we might like that as an idea, but the reality is this, this feeling uh, that one is having at this very moment is like this. When I, when I talk in this way, then this is, 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 is notice it's not, uh, it's not criticizing or giving any value judgments about feeling, but it's, it's an encouragement to notice, to pay attention to feeling. Uh, this is a sense realm that we're living in. So it's very sensitive. Senses, sensitivity, sensuality, it's all about feeling and sensitivity, isn't it? It's the body, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, affects us. The thought, the memories, that arise, the happy ones, unhappy ones, boring ones, the sense of a self, just contemplating uh, the, the result of being attached to this sense of I am, this, this body, I'm this person, this personality, my appearance, my position, and on like this, my, all my identities, uh, as a, on personal identities, attachment to that will always lead to some sense of dissatisfactoriness. Even if I start, try to convince myself I'm the most normal, happy person in the whole universe, that you can't sustain such an illusion. You know, so you, people can play games with their minds and try to, to live in a kind of positive self-view. But in, with mindfulness, what we're doing is observing. You know, we're not trying to, to choose one side over the other, but recognizing that even the negative states, feeling of being no good, hopeless, is like this. Is it, is it, you know, in, when such emotions arise, feelings of despair or hopelessness, arise, or conf confusion, not knowing what to do with your life. Um, seeing yourself through uh, negative perceptions or being very self-conscious and worried about what others think of you is like this. Now when I say it's like this, it's, it's merely, th th this is a way of using language, to bring into consciousness, it, it's like this. It's, it's a, I'm, I'm noticing the actual feeling of self-consciousness or the mood that I might recognize uh, it, that, that is present here and now in consciousness. So it's a listening attentiveness, mindfulness, Awareness, awakenness. Now these are the significant words in, in, uh, in Buddhism. Wake up, isn't it? It's about Bhutto, Buddha, awakened. So when we talk about the Buddha's first sermon, and this is, is a historical 
tradition. So, I mean, it was they, 2,552 years ago <coughs> in India, Saranath in India, there's even, you know, a, a memorial for where the, the Buddha gave his first sermon, if you go to Saranath. That's history, that's memory. But notice that the first sermon <coughs> is, is not about going to Saranath or seeking Buddha or, or believing in some historical sage, but it's the imminent reality of awakened consciousness that each one of us can uh, recognize if we if we, you know, put forth that kind of determination. It, you can't create it. It's not a kind of refined state that you create through controlling conditions, but it, it's a natural state of awakened attentiveness <coughs> that goes unnoticed when we're caught up in the personality, in our feelings, in, our, in, in the... Uh, demands of the society and the world around us. The society we live in is very confused. So we're very much aware of the news now and, and uh, we hear everything that goes on, you know, and I just heard that there's protests in the Urumqi and people being killed there. Now where in the heck is that place? Urumqi. China, of course, East <laughs> Xinjiang, I think, most remote part of China. Urumqi is, uh, and it has the Uyghurs, who are a, a kind of uh, ethnic minority, and a lot of, they call on the, in the news now, Han Chinese. And so these two, two uh, Uyghurs are Muslims, and probably uh, the Chinese uh, society sent a lot of Chinese who were crowded, you know, live in, uh, uh, have, have quite dense population, send them off to these more remote areas to, to start life anew in Tibet or Xinjiang, Arumchi. Well, say, a hundred years ago, probably very few Western people would have ever heard of Xinjiang, uh, not to mention Urumqi, or what goes on there, you know, they're having a, a protest, or, or the, the, there's different problems around uh, ethnic uh, groups, between ethnic groups and religions. But now we hear everything. What happens in Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Honduras now, Things <laughs> we get the whole we, we can we're impinged on by the whole world, and it does affect consciousness. You know the sense of war, of discontentment, unhappiness, of identity with ethnicity, or with religious uh, identities, with political identities, whatever condition we attach to then we, we always have an opposite. We have a, uh, something to fight against and to resist. And so that's why <coughs> there is suffering, why we suffer so much, because <coughs> if we don't awaken, we pay no attention to our lives and really operate out of the conditions, cultural conditioning, personality identities, then we're always going to find ourselves uh, caught in some kind of conflict within ourselves, uh, in the, with somebody else, with the society, the religion, all these problems around class and race and gender are from that kind of ignorance, of not understanding Dhamma and not recognizing the causes of suffering, suffering and its causes. So the Dhammajaka Pawantana Sutta is a very clear <coughs> teaching and very accurate teaching on how to deal with, with suffering and, uh, and, and how to uh, 
see the causes, to recognize the causes of suffering, not, not uh, you know, something caused from outside. It's not the group that wants to make war with you, but it's, it's within you, the cause of suffering. Wanting something you don't have, not wanting something you have. That's just very ordinary for all of us, isn't it? The, the personality, the cultural conditioning, the desire mind is always, we want something better, something we don't have. Wanting something we don't have. Wanting to attain, to achieve, to become. Now that's why I challenge you all the time around, uh, why do you come in, uh, here to this monastery? You know, because most of us start meditation because we, we uh, assume that, say, for example, when I started meditating, I felt I was an unenlightened, confused, and neurotic person who needed to meditate in order to become something better, maybe enlightened in the future. So I'm asking you to look at your own, you know, look at this, not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't think these thoughts, but to recognize that this is a creation. I am somebody that is unenlightened. And I need, if I practice hard enough, I hope will become better person and maybe become enlightened in the future. So this, and so the cause of the suffering are this, you know, this attachment. I'm, I want some, I want to become something that I'm not now. I'm not good enough the way I am and I need to do something in order to become something better in the future. And that, that whole scenario that I've just said is, is a creation. I create that with words, this sense of I'm this person, this physical body, I am somebody that uh, needs to, uh, that sees myself maybe as confused and needs to do something now, hopefully, to maybe get rid of the confusion. I want to get rid of the feeling of confusion or fear or anger or resentment or whatever. I have these emotions, uh, these uh, strong feelings, and I want to get rid of them. And if I meditate, then I'll practice hard, work hard, the work ethic. The longer you sit, the m harder you meditate, the, the more that you should be rewarded for hard work is another creation. Or the other one of, you know, some of the modern attitudes about you shouldn't meditate even, just relax and be happy or pay attention, is there's also attachment to if I just relax and be happy then I will become enlightened in the future. So which side are you going to take or what extreme? Well we use this particular convention, monastic convention. So it's learning how to use this convention, this uh, traditional form for awakenness, not for identity, not for picking and choosing, but for, it, it's a tool, it's an expedient means, it's a tool to help us to recognize the causes of suffering. So the important thing is to, you know, not to identify with the you know, this create another uh, artificial identity with monasticism, but to, you know, recognize like the, the two uh, new Anagarikas encourage you to use this time, this year that you've determined for this uh, observing, to, to watch, to observe, to listen to yourself. And no matter what happens to you, whether, you know, you know, if you feel uh, whatever you're feeling, you feel inspired or angry or exploited or you, you feel inferior because you're only an anagarika and uh, the bhikkhus are 
superior to you, and uh, you could make a, you could create suffering around that, your position. But the encouragement is to really observe that. It's not asking not to feel anything or that you should feel guilty if you do have such thoughts, but to be the knower. They are what they are. So then, in a position of saying, well, if there's, if, you know, if, if it's not true, then if I'm really, you know, uh, you know, if there's no self, and there's no time, time and his illusion, then what, what, what should I do? What's there to do? And then, then you can listen to that, being confused, or not knowing what to do. Because we're attached to the thinking process, to ideas. We can be attached to, to Buddhist ideas or ideals. So we form, you know, in the Buddhist world, there's a lot of opinions, hardline opinions among various Buddhists about how to practice and what's real practice and what isn't, what's real Dhamma and what isn't and so forth. Because we can attach to, our, to views about Buddhism, to interpretations we f form from reading scriptures, from what teachers say. But the main emphasis of this, the whole point of this Dhammajaka Pawantana Sutta is not to give you something to attach to uh, and, and operate from that attachment, but to observe attachment. So the second noble truth is about attachment to desire, ignorance of Dhamma and the attachment, the desires that arise in this realm, in this consciousness, and the attachment to those, to those desires. So those desires, like gamma dhanha, sensual desire, wanting uh, pleasure, beauty, always seeking happiness through sensuality, through the eyes, uh, ears, nose, tongue, body. Or wanting to become, you know, bhava dhanha. So there's gamma dhanha, bhava dhanha, vipava dhanha. Bhava dhanha, is desire for becoming, attaining, achieving. It can be very good desire, you know, to want to become enlightened. It's certainly a fine aspiration. To want to attain Nibbana, to want to uh, become free from ignorance. But still, that's the creation of the mind. And I want to get rid of my defilements and become somebody who's free from ignorance. It's still a, a self-scenario, isn't it? It's a still sakya ditti. It's still a creation. It can be a very good one, but it is that. And that's why just attaching to aspiration and so forth is still suffering. We still suffer, no matter how high-minded our values might be and our intentions, how pure and good our intentions might be. Because that sense of becoming, wanting to become. So awareness then allows us to observe as a mental object, you know, wanting to become something is like this. Wanting to, then the Vipavadana, the, uh, wanting to get rid of. Wanting to get rid of bad thoughts or fear. Wanting to get rid of fear and anger and so forth. And people ask me, what can I do about anger and fear? How can I, how can I conquer fear and jealousy and anger? And so this is desire to get rid of something we don't like. And so you notice that, that what I'm doing is in the second noble truth, this is for reflection. It's really, it's not trying to get rid of desire. The desire to get rid of desire is vipavadana. The desire to get rid of bad thoughts and, 
and uh, anger and and uh, fear and all that is still whipa vadana. And so whipa vadana is like this. You get a feeling, this sense of awakened attention to this feeling of I've got to get rid of these bad thoughts, these uh, childish emotions, uh, these uh, unwholesome tendencies. I've got to get rid of them. Uh, you know, so you can actually begin to notice that which is aware and the, and the desire are not the same thing. It's awareness that is not about becoming anything. It's, it's learning to recognize, to awaken, to recognize, realize, awakened consciousness here and now and to cultivate it. So during this vasa, this is, will be the emphasis as always on awakened attention. You know, so you, you know, it's a, even though at moments we, we do it, we, it's easily, we're easily pulled back into the, the, the momentum of our habits and feelings. Living in a community also, we're, we're very, you know, we're exposed to the feelings and, uh, of others, many people, in fact, in a large community like this. So we're affected by what they're feeling, what others say, what others think, what others are feeling. So this is like sensitivity is like this. It's what impinges, what on you, on, on your mind, on your, or your senses. And then the liberation from suffering is awakened attention to it. Knowing that it, it is what it is. And then we have the, this uh, clear teaching about the causes of suffering, the blind attachment to um, gama dana, bhava dana, vipava dana, and then the, then the insight to let go of dana. But before you let go of dana, you have to know what it is. And letting go is not vipava dana. Letting go of d desire is not about getting rid of it, but letting it go. L desires like this, so you're studying you're observing dana, and so in in this kind of reflective style of mind, we say it's like gamma dana is like this. So when I feel gamma dana, you know, through the senses, it's like this, or I can make it into a personal problem of here I am a monk, I should be free from sensual desire. So here I'm at forty-three vasas. And I see something that, uh, you know, that attracts me and I want it. It's like this. Or I could make it into personal defect. I could say, Tomato, 43 vasas now, and you still have Gamadanha. You're, <laughs> and that is Sakaya Ditti. So you see you know, what I'm pointing at. I'm not trying to, to, to annihilate desire or to ignore it or deny it, but to recognize it. Because this realm that we're living in is the desire realm. It's all about desire, wanting and not wanting, isn't it? This, this, uh, that's what sensu sensuality is all about, being sensitive. And so the awareness then is is the is what the Buddha po you know emphasized the essence of the teaching is this awareness mindfulness with wisdom so that we discern we we can we're not making value judgments about desire and non desire but recognizing desire and discerning desire so. Uh, when we're blindly attached to desire, we can just let it go, let it be what it is. Letting go is not aversion and, and destruction, but 
just relaxing, letting go of the different the gama dana, bhava dana, vipava dana through recognizing it. So this is wisdom, this is panya. To know, to discern, conditions are all, you know, changing, anicca, dukkha, nata, desire, dana is anicca, dukkha, nata, kama, dana, sensual desire is anicca, dukkha, nata, impermanent, anicca, impermanent, it's changing, and unsatisfactory, dukkha, anatta, non-self, where when I say, oh, I shouldn't have such desires, that then I'm creating self out of the desire. Oh, no, it's my desire, and, and I shouldn't, and then I create the sense of it's mine, and I shouldn't have such thoughts or such desires. That is, I create that out of ignorance, out of blindness, out of not understanding. Not having penetrated, or having not having any insight into Dhamma or reality, then I do create myself in very complicated patterns. <clears throat> As we all do, we all suffer enormously through, through our neurotic personalities, complicated ways of thinking, identities, views and opinions, ideals. And it's the ignorance and attachment, it's not the the conditions themselves, because we're experiencing the conditioned realm. It's like this, the physical body. Uh, you know, it's not going to, uh, when you're aware, enlightened, the body's still here. It's not like you're, you know, it, it transmutes into an ethereal uh, kind of body. It's still this, this body like, the, like it is now. But the relationship to the body is then knowing it rather than identifying with it. So see, like this, this opportunity we have as human, human individuals, like the Buddha emphasized that this teaching of the Four Noble Truths is, he says, Deva, Deva Manusa Nang. Devas are, are uh, like, celestial beings, and manusia, that's human beings. So we're manusia, at least. I don't see myself as a deva. And the body's definitely manusia. And so uh, it's not, there's nothing ethereal about my body. Uh, in fact, it's getting old and uh, it's getting more stiff and more problems. <laughs> uh, so after 43 years of meditation, the the body still gets old, ages, degenerates, and that's, that's, that's just the way conditioned phenomena operates. But the change from identity to uh, the being the knower of the body, it's a condition that was born, it's reached this, this age, and it, and it will die in the future. Now this awareness, mindfulness, aparuta de sangama tasa tawara. When the Buddha was enlightened, he made this announcement: the gates to the deathless are open. Amatasa tawara, gates tawara is like door or gate to the deathless. So the deathless amatasa. So it's like, it's, it's, it's an announcement, and I've always liked this, this particular Pali phrase, because it, to me it, uh, it just reminds me all the time, the gates to the deathless are open. So when I forget that and get caught up in, uh, in the death-bound conditions of self, views, and, and emotions, and that, just saying, uh, Aparuta de Sangamatasa Taura is a way of reminding myself. It's not a magic formula that, that, that I attach to out of ignorance, but it, it's a skillful reminder of reality. The gates of the deathless are open. Where are these gates? And then, of course, it's not about seeking gates externally, but 
recognize it's mindfulness, isn't it? It always comes back to awareness, mindfulness here and now. Everything, you know, no matter how complicated, urgent, uh, extreme conditioned phenomena may get for any of us, the gates to the deathless are always open. It's just a matter of remembering. So that's like sati sampachanya. So these, uh, you know, we forget it and then we remember it. So in this meditating on this Dhammajaka Pawantana Sutta, if you use it and cultivate it, you know, it's for being used. It's not, it's not just a pretty book where admiring is a kind of objet da, but it's a really, it's, a, it's something to, to internalize these Four Noble Truths until you know the, you have the insight. They're no longer just teachings of the Lord Buddha, the first sermon, but they're, you know, they've, uh, they, they're, they're, they've guided you as an individual human being to awaken and to trust in awakeness and to cultivate it. Because the pressures uh, of the conditioned realm are intense and very believable. And we're living in a society that believes in the conditioned realm as reality. And, and so the, the time, the society we live in is a time where the, uh, you know, the, there's, there's no great moral demands on us anymore. Uh, we can do, you know, there's tremendous freedom to do what we want in a country like this. Certain limitations uh, of laws and whatnot, but generally speaking, uh, it's um, pretty free to indulge in sensuality, to, to assert yourself, to become somebody, become a celebrity, uh, become an important person, prove yourself, or to take drugs, drink, sexual freedom, do whatever you like, travel. You don't have to have arranged marriages or for you free from your uh, from the domination of parents. Do what I want. I'm independent and free, and I can do what I want. <coughs> and so the society is very. For me, anyway, this is the kind of society that formed my personality, was one that, that, that we valued, these, this sense of a self-assertion and, uh, you know, demanding rights and seeing myself as having to prove myself and get what I can. But then in that, even when one is fairly successful at it, it's still unsatisfactory. So. This, you know, most of us are here because there's something in us, an intuitive sense that recognizes it's not just getting what we want and, and having a life, you know, based on just everything being what we like and what we want and what we demand, but it's about learning, understanding, using this incarnation as a human individual for awakened attention, to learn, to investigate Dhamma. So in, in the monastic forms, it's, this is the purpose and intention of this, of this tradition is to give this opportunity to have a structure uh, to work with for m awareness, mindfulness, not to, uh, and uh, when we attach to it, identify with it, then we suffer from being, I can suffer from being senior monk at Amravati. You know, from being the, the teacher, the abbot, the big guy. I can create all kinds of neurotic problems around. Sometimes I hate being in this position personally having to be somebody all the time out in front, everybody looking. I make that into some kind of neurotic problem for myself, and I've certainly 
done it in the past, but the difference now is I don't believe in it. You know, it's all right. There's nothing wrong with the position. It's how I relate to this position as, as a self, as an identity, or as a reference. This is the way it is. These feelings, personal feelings are this way. They are what they are. <coughs> so, you know, say, you might think being head monk is a very privilege and, you d and I don't suffer like you do because you're at the end of the line, I'm at the f front of it. And that's not true, is it? We, we create suffering around whatever, you know, whether we're at the top or the bottom of the pile. Because the conditioned realm is like that. It's never, it can never satisfy us. We'll never find contentment in, in any condition whatsoever. So contentment then is a result of the holy life. And what is a holy about this life? You know, what do we mean by the holy life? Is it, we're not trying, are we trying to become saintly? Trying to, to make ourselves into saints by controlling everything and being nice and moral and good and think nice thoughts and spread metta all the time? Or are we actually using this life for awakened attention to the karma that we're experiencing now, the way it is. Now this is very important to, to see, to get to discern the difference between conditioned phenomena and the unconditioned or the deathless. This Deathless reality is awareness. It's non-personal. It has no quality at all. It is not superior, inferior, good, bad, right, wrong, refined, of course. It's here and now, and it's a matter of recognizing it. It's not that that I have more than you do, or that some people have more than somebody else. I mean, that's another creation, isn't it? When we start thinking of, of quality and quantity, then that we're back in the conditioned realm. It's a matter of recognizing, attention, and, and learning to, to change from somebody trying to get something and control and manipulate the conditioned realm to being aware of that of ambition, of wanting something, of not wanting something. And this Tamajaka Pavatana Sutta is, is, a, is the guide for this kind of practice. Third noble truth, letting go of desire, then there is the reality of cessation. Because all that arises ceases. So when, if you never let go of conditions, you're just going, you're always going from one condition to the next. You never, you're not aware of the cessation of them. You're always wanting something going on to the next. So with this, this insight into letting go of desire, then you can actually discern the cessation of desire. Desire arises and ceases. So it's not a suppression or an annihilation. You're not destroying desire. You're not annihilating it. You're not denying it or ignoring it. You're just letting it cease because that's what it does. And the discerning ability is this mindfulness, discerning the cessation, desire that has arisen now is like this, letting go of it. You can actually witness its absence desirelessness is like this. So this is uh, like the deathless then, the amatasa tawara, the gate to the deathless. This is, that is available to every single one of us. You know, it's not the prerogative of, of a special 
specially advanced human being. It's a matter of recognizing, of awakened an interest in it. Determination to 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 penetrate it and cultivate it. So the fourth noble truth is about cultivating this emptiness, this anatta, non-self, non-desire, non-attachment. <coughs> so then this is in in bhavana, developing or cultivating this in, in daily life, like in the monastic life here at Amarvati. Cultivating it is to use it. Whatever, you know, is happening, pleasant or painful, good or bad, it's, it's cultivating this awareness. It is what it is. Now in a monastery like this, traditional Theravada monastery, we're alms mendicants. So recognize that this is that this alms mendicancy that that we've chosen as our way of living puts us in a relationship to the society different from a wage earner or a comp somebody competing in the social scene. So we're not, you know, we we've chosen intentionally chosen like the two new anagarchas you know, had to ask for the eight precepts. You can't just force them, you know, if I had to, you know, by gunpoint, wouldn't be of any value. <laughs> but they have to ask. I mean, we all ask for, for this, for training, for living in this way. So it's, it's our own choice. So our relationship to the society changes from being uh, a citizen with rights and and using the society and trying to and, rev and changing it and 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 taking sides in the society, but observing our relationship to the society is one uh, of non-complaining, non-aversion. As all mendicants, we're dependent on the lay community for the very necessities uh, uh, for existence, food, shelter, clothing, and medicine. So these four requisites, these the basic necessities that any human individ individual needs to survive, it's, uh, it's supplied by the lay community. <coughs> and so this is, because of this, then we tend to draw uh, good people to this place. So, you know, my experience, 25 years here at Amrabhati, uh, generally speaking, you know, I've seen, you know, I've been the uh, one who's received this incredible generosity from the lay community in terms of the support for the shelter, the, the robes, the food, the, the medicine. So this brings out generosity in the lay community. It is different than if we were in some kind of competitive relationship with them or a tyrannical one where we're bossing them around and, and intimidating them and preaching at them. And then it's not that. We're not, we're not preachers or, or missionaries or, uh, or, you know, priests that, that try to intimidate people, but living in a way uh, in a in, in, with this convention, cultivating awareness. And then the, that generates that kind of respect and support from the society. Mm. So that the society responds. And this is not a Buddhist country. You know, so it's, it's most of the people uh, hardly know anything at all about Buddhism. But still, uh, this monastery can exist here because it, it does work here. People respond to to uh, to this li to our life, and many of you who've gone on Tudong on uh, you know journeys in the countryside, walking depending on alms food and walking through England or Scotland or Ireland, you know I don't hear anyone who said they've had any you know there was nobody that cared or responded to 
the fact of being an alms mendicant. Even though you, you, you know, you may not come and meet a Buddhist at all. But it's still bringing out this good quality, this generosity, this part of our humanity, the good side of being human. So in this way, we're, we, you know, we're alms mendicants and relationship is, is one of dependency, but not a kind of clinging and demanding dependency. We're not trying to intimidate or, or uh, use, use our position to gain anything. Just through our own integrity and determination, see what happens. From my experience, it, you know, it, it's been um, rather amazingly wonderful to, to, have, to have lived 43 years as an alms mendicant. 33 of those years here in England. And this is, uh, you know, so, it, you know, and not having any great difficulties whatsoever around survival or the four requisites. So this is something to, you know, to, to remember in the, the basic, that the, the Sangha, as it lives its life, practicing the Dhamma, then it also, it, it inspires and gives hope to the, to the lay society around us. People long to see, uh, inte long to know people with integrity and to, to uh, no matter how strange we might look in these Buddhist robes in this society, there is a feeling that, uh, 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 that is aroused of we're here not for vanity or for some kind of revolutionary uh, shocking to shock the, the population, but it's, it, it's kind of a, a sign to people, it's an archetype almost, of, of that of a human individual awakened, alert, living a life that is worthy of respect worthy of alms. So this is, this is quite a, an odd thing to be doing at this time in a very materialistic society, affluent society. And now the society is going through terrible crises uh, uh, economically and worldwide. Uh, things are, you know, the, the hopes for increased uh, pleasure and affluence and wealth and things getting better and better, better and better, and now they're getting worse. People don't know how to deal with that. They like the idea of progress, of things getting better and better. But in terms of condition phenomena, things don't get better. They get better and better, and then they get worse. Things just don't, condition phenomena can't get better and better forevermore. So this is a, a kind of natural wisdom and understanding of the limitation of conditioned phenomena. And once that really sinks in, you really understand that on a deep level, then you're not expecting conditioned phenomena, demanding the impossible from it, or being uh, upset when it changes for the worse. One can deal with the changing conditions if you have this kind of wisdom, this insight. One can deal with, can, one can learn from whatever, from progress, from degeneration, from good health, bad health. If we know this, if we have this awakenedness and willingness to cultivate this awakened awareness and the notice then that this dukkha, this first noble truth, that which is aware of dukkha or suffering is not that. And so this dukkha, suffering, is always, you know, using this first noble truth not as some kind of, of uh, outside uh, thing, but to that which is aware, that awareness itself is not dukkha. So then, when, you, when that begins to really, when you really 
understand that through insight, then you cultivate awareness rather than, than try to cultivate or uh, endlessly try to manipulate the condition realm. Because that's the, that's the liberation, is the awareness. So discerning then, in, in this human form, recognize the limitation we're under. We're limited to this, the form, the bodies that we have. So we're not God, knowing everything about everything from the top. So no matter what our bodies are like, it's not the issue, is it? It's not a matter of, of, of even being healthy or anything. It's a matter of, of awakened attention. So the, the body itself is, is, a very, is a limitation we find ourselves with. But the awareness then is not limited by the body. But we experience consciousness through this form, this human form that we call our, our bodies. So these are conscious forms. And then the human, the human uh, birth is the ability to awaken consciousness to reality, to the real, to Dhamma. And that's why uh, the human birth is, is considered a very good one. Because we have we have to live in this sense realm, in this you know, when you look at the the natural state around us, and the, it's, it is survival of the fittest for most creatures, isn't it? It's learning how to survive, and everything eating you know, everything eating each other. It's all about eating and and procreating and and killing, devouring surviving, law of the jungle, on one level. And we can operate in that same way. You know, we're quite capable of uh, murdering and killing and, and uh, exploiting conditioned phenomena or the environment, or our own bodies, or someone else. Populations, tyrants, take advantage of whole populations of people. But in, in uh, awareness, then, we can develop it in, in this form, this sense of attentiveness. And then, because of the, the, this particular convention of alms mendicancy, then it allows us to, to live in a wholesome relationship to the society we're in. So we're not turning our backs on the world and, and rejecting the society, but we're learning to live within the society, but not be overwhelmed, intimidated, and, and up, up, upset by the changing conditions the, of the society, the, po the politics, the economy, social changes that happen inevitably in any society. And then the human birth is one to, to see as an opportunity. To, and, then, and then this particular teaching is a very clear and accurate instruction on how to, how to break through the illusions, the ignorant illusions that we create, that we've been conditioned with. So I offer this for your consideration. <laughs>